Good morning, everyone. Can, uh, my name is Casey Lazan. I'm Deputy Executive Director for SACOG. And um, can we give another round of applause to that? Because I, I loved it. And no, it was intentional. It was like the perfect tee up for um, what we're about to talk about now, which is livable housing solutions. Now, I just have the privilege of being here to help moderate the conversation about those housing solutions with folks that you will be uh, meeting very soon. Um, what I actually have to do first is I am going to help define the problem that these solutions are going to be um, addressing. And so what I'm checking on, perfect. So I'm gonna start off with setting up for you a progress report of how our region is doing um, with one of our basic needs, housing. And let's, uh, Let's frame it in something um, kind of in the big picture, that this region, since the gold rush, has been a place that people want to come to. And we have had uh, the challenges and the benefits of all of that growth, of all of that population growth. In fact, in the last 20 years, so in this 21st century, the Sacramento region has been a very fast-growing region. Um, it's been, uh, in the, even the last five years, it's been the fastest growing in the state, um, followed by uh, the San Joaquin Valley and then the rest of the regions. And then you can see way on the far end of this graph, um, that's the U.S. population growth rate. So we're dynamic, we're changing, we're growing, and that's a good thing. But as I am going to talk about and lay out for you, the reason we're even talking about solutions is that we've had some challenges with that, particularly um, over the last, um, I'd say, decade or more, in that we've been growing slower, but still growing very quickly. But what this uh, graph is showing you here, that green line up at the top, that shows you our actual population growth over the last 20 years. And the orange dotted line shows you how much housing that should be built to keep up with our population growth. And the orange solid line shows you the actual amount of housing that's being built. And you can see that at one point, back at the beginning of the century, we were doing pretty good. And then around 2008, Great Recession, we got hit hard. And so we've had a problem that's been over a decade in the making of we have not been building enough housing to meet the basic needs of our neighbors. Now, in SACOG's projections, when we do long-range planning, working with all of our cities and counties, working with economists to see where are we at and where are we going and what do we need for this region to thrive, we need to be building about 10,000 housing units a year in order to meet the needs of our population. And what you see from those orange lines is that we're probably averaging in the last five years about 7,000 homes a year. We all feel that. <clears throat> now, the good news is um, it's not showing up here because it's so new and so fresh that I don't even have a full year of it. But in the first half of 2022, we've actually seen housing production come up. It's 26% higher than it was last year, and that's fantastic. But we don't get to sit back and claim victory on that. We have a lot more work to do because in addition to just the total amount of housing that we need to be bringing up for all of our neighbors, we also need to look at the type of housing that we're building. And I'm going to be showing you a whole bunch of different types that we want to be building more of. Right now in this region, we mostly build the standard large lot single family home product. I think we are all very familiar with that. It's a great product. But we also need to see way more multifamily housing and small lot single family housing. In fact, when we look into the future, we need to have about three quarters of our housing production to be in these different types, apartments, small cottages, accessory dwelling units, townhomes, duplexes, uh, triplexes. There's so many amazing and wonderful types of housing that can meet and accommodate a variety of lifestyles for whatever point you are in your life, but we need to be building a lot more of that. Now, um, the other part about this, so overall production, type of housing, where, location, Location is also very important. <clears throat> to accommodate our future population growth in a way that allows people to thrive, to be able to live all of the different stages of their life, to uh, accommodate growth equitably and sustainably, 
We need about a third of our new housing over the next 20 to 30 years to occur in centers and corridors in communities. And I'll get to what that means, but I want to set up for you a third, 33%. And right now, last 10 years, we've been doing about 12 to 17% of our production in these areas. So that's a challenge. It's part of the gap that we're trying to close. What are these centers and corridors? Well, they're main streets. They're downtowns. They're train station areas. They're commercial corridors, a lot of commercial corridors. We actually have a lot of 20th century um, auto-oriented commercial corridors in, in every community in the region, and they are crying for some change and some reinvestment and to become more people-focused. And we have that opportunity. Every community in the region has identified places where this could happen. What is it that it's gonna take to make it happen? So, those are centers and corridors. Now, why am I focused on production, type of housing, location for housing? Because at the end of the day, it's about our basic needs, right? Back to the beginning, people. The people who make our communities livable, the people who run our economy, the people who sustain us. And the challenges that we're facing right now, they look different in every single community. They affect everybody differently. Um, but one thing that I want to pull from uh, the Evans Livability poll that um, you saw earlier is that um, we're facing some very visceral challenges. When you think about how people are able to live, to just run their daily life, how many people are spending more than 30% of their income towards housing? You saw some information about how um, people don't feel they have enough, right, to, to meet bills and the rent or the mortgage. Well, uh, in my planning world that I live in, that's called housing cost burden. If you're paying more than 30% of your monthly income as a household towards your housing, you're struggling to be able to meet all of the other needs that you have. In our region, and these numbers are to really, um, they kind of corroborate what you heard from the poll, because these are census numbers, and they're a little bit older, so they look a little lower, so just harken back to, they've actually gotten a bit worse. But in our general population, right, this is like from a few years ago, 37% of households were housing cost burdened. And when you dig in just a little bit deeper, 44% of Hispanic households are housing cost burdened and over 50% of black households are housing cost burden. Now, I know that all of you can probably think into your own lives or into the lives of others you know or have heard of, of how this housing uh, crisis has hit differently. You know what that feels like. So with that in mind, I wanna wrap this up by saying, look, that was our progress report. I'm just delivering the news. Whether it's good or bad, this is what the news is. Um, we do have some hope though, as I said, look, housing production, it's starting to pick up. Uh, we can't sit back though, and so what I'm going to do now is tee it up for our guests here um, to really inspire you and to call you to action. So with that, let's, uh, all right, let's introduce our panelists here. Um, we have, let's see, starting from your left to my right. <laughs> I'm going to mess that up. Um, we have Rick Jennings Jr. He, or, sorry, Rick Jennings II. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I did that right. Um, city council member from the city of Sacramento, chair of the SACOG board. We have Bonnie Gore. Um, she is a supervisor with Sacramento County, or, sorry, Placer County. I'm just nervous, you guys. Do you know the last time I stood in front of a group this big? Thank you for your grace. I appreciate all of you. Bonnie Gore is a supervisor with Placer County, um, and she's also a former, former SACOG board chair. And then Rashawn Davis, who is an entrepreneur, a community developer, a cultural strategist, and my new friend. Yes. yes. OK, so please give them all a round of applause. Okay. Testing. Are we on? I think we are. Yeah. Yep. Okay, great. All right, so give Casey a big round of applause as well. Would you please? She, she may not believe it, but she did a great job.
setting up this whole panel, and we just all applaud you for getting up on that mic, doing what you do. Once again, another big round of applause, Stop. please. Okay, okay, I set it up. Let's not forget why we're here. All right, so I have a question, and I want to start with Bonnie for this one. So we have heard uh, from, in SACOG, from housing developers, from local government officials, from housing advocates, that the cost of development, particularly infill development, the kind we want to see in the centers and corridors I described, that it's prohibitive. How can we overcome all of this cost issue? Well, good morning, everyone, and it's great to be here in Sacramento. When I arrived, somebody said, gee, thanks for making your way all the way down here. And I said, you know what? This is our region. So I might live in Roseville and represent Placer County, but I love being a part of this region. And it's really exciting to come and talk about these issues as a region, because like you said, there's so many challenges, and, and how can we work together to make, it, make this, the housing issues work? So um, infill is super expensive. You talked about corridors and the need to have more housing on those corridors. Well, I'm really excited about the work SACOG has done over a number of years. We realize that we've got to put housing near mobility centers. We have to have areas walkable, near jobs. And then we also have to address the greenhouse, greenhouse gas issue. So we had a program called Green Means Go. We advocated for state funding for several years. We finally got funding from the state of California uh, for the state to actually fund Green Means Go. But we are sort of the pilot project. And the idea is let's take money and put it into the infrastructure of these corridors so that then we can help developers actually build out the spaces. And so we're seeing that in Placer County. We have an area called the Auburn, Auburn Bowman area, which is between I-80 and Highway 49 up in Auburn. And that, that area is like the 80s style development. Uh, big box um, businesses, think of Kmart, big roads, uh, big parking lots, and a lot of empty space now. But we need places for people to live. And so if you want to revitalize, reimagine that area, uh, we're in the process of doing that, right? Making some of those duplexes and triplexes and different types of housing. But to provide for the water and the sewer and the roads, it is really cost prohibitive. So these Green Mean Go funds are going to help local jurisdictions put sewers, sewer expansion in the ground so that we can help build. So I'm really excited about that. Um, our county's working on that. All the other SACOG jurisdictions are looking at areas where they can address that infrastructure so then we can help developers get housing built. Thank you, Bonnie. That is, well, I think that is very exciting. I hear what you're saying is, you know, bringing down the cost of all of the stuff that goes in the ground so that someone can come in um, and if they want to invest in housing in that corridor, that that cost is something that's already been taken care of. That's, we want to see more of that. And we're, ex we're excited because we actually have some projects doing that. I, we that put is. some money um, in the county into a project in Auburn. Um, $500,000 of sewer was ARPA dollars um, into the sewer infrastructure, and 56 homes are going to be built. They're duplexes, there's some multifamily, some single family, but we're getting homes built. But think about that, about $500,000 of sewer so that we can make 56 affordable homes. Yeah. So we have to remember that that's why it's so expensive, and that's why we need to work together to address this. Yeah. That makes so much sense. So this is how we get those, uh, you know, the, the physical buildings. That's a really wonderful solution to get the physical place in, um, um, happening. Now, I want to ask Rick. So in these corridors right now, there are places that we might drive to and we definitely drive through, right? Who's on the team to transform these into vibrant places, you know, in addition to the buildings? Who do we need to help this happen? Well. That's a great question, and I think the solution is right here in this room. We, we need the people who live in those communities, we need the businesses that are there, the nonprofit centers, all the different elements, whether it be government, whether it be schools, all those elements need to be a part of the solution to rebuild some of these aging corridors in order to reinvest in them 
to make the kind of housing that we want. Most people are comfortable with where they live, but they haven't seen new housing, they haven't seen new businesses, they haven't seen solutions that make them live like other places in Sacramento or in our Sacramento region. So when we can make, bring the people together and they can start the process of starting to plan their community to live like they want it to live, to make it walkable, to make it bikeable, to make sure that you can go to businesses in your community. You don't have to get in your car to go outside of your community. You can go right here and live, work, and play right in the community that you grew up in and where your parents invested, you can invest as well and your children will probably follow in that investment. That's great, I'm seeing it. I've got the place, there's a place in my head, I'm already picturing it. We just have to make it happen. Okay, let's dig down even further. So you're talking about all the different types of people we need to, to really form the team to transform our communities. Let's get even more specific. This is for you, Rashawn. So who are we trying to attract to invest in these places? That's a good question. When I think about who we're trying to attract to invest, I can't not talk about who's already there because I feel like that's a part of what happens with gentrification. It's like we get people who are outside to invest into our communities instead of looking at the folks who are in, in the neighborhoods, like Rick said, and work with those folks first to then build them up. And then we work with the different entities, whether it's a government entity, whether it's a small business, whether it's a nonprofit organization, whether it's folks in the community, the neighborhood associations. There's so many different la layers and levels to what makes up a community and when we work from inside to then attract out, not saying that we don't want that money to come into the neighborhoods, but there has to be a way for us to monetize it, to strengthen it from the inside of the neighborhoods or else we get the same data that we're seeing, which is a lot of these neighborhoods are black and brown folks that live there, you know? So unless we're putting in that infrastructure at the beginning, mm -hmm. then it doesn't matter who we attract on the outside, right? So it's working on all of those different layers and then building the partnerships and building the ecosystem to really make sure that all of those cylinders are firing at the same time. You know, a lot of the times we get into these spaces where people would look at me and say, I'm a placemaker, you know, and then they'd look at SACOG and say they're a government entity. And if we're not working together, then they're working in their silo doing the green initiatives. And then we're working and we're doing cool events, but we're missing the mark on all of the places. So getting us outside of the silos and working more as an ecosystem together creates kind of like the team he's saying and makes us all fire on those same, same cylinders. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. Because at the end of the day, you know, you think of any place that we're in and no one sees the lines of like, this is, you know, what the public works department of the government put together and this part is owned by the property owner and the business inside, that's theirs. Like nobody sees the lines, they just live, right? And so if you want it to work, I hear you saying, we have to try to like kind of cross those lines, cement together. Yep. That's great. And speak the same language. Hey. Planner, creative, <laughs> best friends. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. This question is for all of you. I think we've teed up, um, hopefully in everyone's mind, the, you know, that, that community that we're all envisioning. So from, for each of you, from your perspectives as um, city elected official, county elected official, um, entrepreneur, uh, private developer, what can government do to remove barriers to and facilitate infill housing production from each of your perspectives? I'll go ahead and start. So Placer County is working really hard at becoming a pro-housing community. I think the city of Sacramento is there and we, um, you know, we have a lot of greenfield housing, right? Lots of open space that's being developed, but we have these aging corridors, and so what can we do? Because we really need more affordable housing in our community. So a couple of things. We recently, our board, made some code amendments, some changes to our zoning. So commercial corridors, which are typically just commercial, we have now made mixed use where a developer could come in and 
do a mixed use housing and commercial development in a commercial corridor. And now we're allowing them to do that. They don't have to come and ask for permission. We've now changed our code to do that. And we're doing that with multifamily housing. So now multifamily housing could be commercial and multifamily so that it actually helps those developers pencil it out because it is expensive to do. And so we're trying to find ways to allow developers to be flexible with products. The other thing I'm really excited about is the um, accessory dwelling units, ADUs for short, and now people really have by right the opportunity to build an ADU if there's enough space in their backyard uh, to produ produce a additional housing. And in Plaster County, we've got a lot of places where people have big backyards, right? Not enough affordable housing. So what we've done is we're making plans, free plans available to our residents. So plans for an ADU, 500 square feet up to 750 square feet, we're handing people those applications or those, those plans, and we've seen the number of ADUs increased. In the last five years, we've had almost 500 applications submitted, 346 permits issued for ADUs, and 201 ADUs built. So that's huge, that's 201 additional housing units in our neighborhoods, in our communities, and those are typically for folks who don't have as much money, right? Lower income, working folks, it might be college students, it might be um, a grandparent, but those are additional units. And so we're really trying to encourage people to do that because it's a, a little bit easier way and we're making it a little bit more cost affordable, right? We're gonna hand you your plans and that's probably several thousand dollars you do not have to hand to an architect. That's great. That's a, I, I, I hear in that um, what we were just talking about, like, you know, trying to figure out how to close the gap between government and um, the, the private resident or the private person who's trying to also contribute to solving our housing problems. That's wonderful. Rick, what about you? Yeah, I, I think Bonnie is right on. And, and when government can do its role as far as setting policies to help make it easier for developers to be able to invest in areas, um, it's a win-win situation for everyone. I'm proud of the city of Sacramento, and I want to get this right, so I, I want to read it to you. The first in the state to receive the California State Housing and Community Development Pro-Housing designation by reducing barriers to helping build more affordable housing in infill areas. And how did they do that? By reducing some of the parking elements, parking requirements, and streamlining approvement, uh, approvals for the building permits. And so when government can start changing its policies in order to help with developers who want to come in and invest, that means they're investing in these old corridors that we need investment in, and it makes it easier for them to be able to come in and build the housing that we need, all the different levels of housing for everyone in all populations. And so then that gets us back to that work, live, and play. Mm -hmm. We can work, live, and play right in the area, and it impacts the people. I mean, to me, this is all about serving the people. And so I ask the question right now myself, because we're at Sac State University. I ask the question myself that says, what does the next generation want in housing? And I, I believe that's why we're here, so we can get some of those answers, so we can start preparing for it today for what they're going to need tomorrow. Because I think that's what we really should be doing as policymakers, is making sure that we set the path for them to be able to own housing. They're not going to be outpriced out of the market. They're going to be able to come into housing, whatever that housing type might be, they're going to be able to come into the market and be able to do the greatest thing that I think all of us have done, is home ownership. That's great. So we're trying to set the platform for people to build their future lives on. Absolutely. That's great. Thank you. Okay, Rashawn, you got a great, unique perspective here. You got to bring it in. Let's weave it together. It's interesting because, as I said, I love like the policy. I love weaving it together for the next generation. I think one of the things that government can do is really teach and so educate through like technical assistance and things like that. Um, the power of equity and what equity really means, because until you own a house, you really don't understand equity and that's something like for me you know a lot of people 
who know me in this room would say, oh, he's one of the guys that helped develop Oak Park, you know? And for us, nine years ago being there, people told us to buy a house. We didn't even understand why, right? Houses were going for 150,000 easy. Now, we tried to buy a house there in 2021, just last year, and got priced out at like 800,000. And so this place that we helped create, we didn't even reap the benefits of equity, of home ownership. So until you own a home, then you don't know what equity is. You don't even know how to calculate it. You don't even understand it. You don't even know the power of it until you own. And I had to go outside of Oak Park, buy a house in lovely Greenhaven. I love Greenhaven, by the way. So like, I, I walk in the Greenbelt all the time. So I appreciate it now, but just seeing the equity that I've built in the last three years or four years, we've been there four years now, the equity that I've built in the last four years to understand now that if I would have bought a house in Oak Park in the, in the neighborhood that I was trying to help uplift, where I would be now and how different life would be now. You can't get there unless you're like truly educated on it. So I think government policy and changing things like that is like there needs to be an education piece for folks who don't understand it. And it usually is black and brown folks because we haven't been in a place of ownership before, so. May I add to that? So speaking of equity, I think a lot of times people think about affordable housing and they think of multifamily housing. And that's good, but it's not enough. So what can we do to encourage you know, smaller homes being built and duplexes and triplexes so that somebody can buy a home and start building equity? It's so very important. And, and so that's some of the conversation we have to have. How do we encourage developers to look at other products of housing? Um, and then another thing I, th I think that we're looking at doing as far as local government, right? What We did a survey of what empty land do we have as a county? Mm -hmm. And then letting folks know, hey, there's opportunity to do some building here. Um, churches, we have churches with a whole lot of land, lots of land around them. How do we work with our churches um, to allow them to build some housing and partner with them? I, I asked, do we need to rezone? And my planning director said, most of our churches are in residential areas or zoned residential. Well, guess what? Then you can build residential homes, and maybe that's a, a way to build some money for a church, but then provide home ownership for residents in the community. So I think we have to really look at how can we be creative, what land do we have available, and let's make sure we have some for sale product, not just multifamily, which is really important, but for sale product as well. So I just want to add one thing, and this is a challenge to everyone in the audience. It's called Each One Teach One. Each One Teach One. So there are people in this audience who 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, I talked to about buying property in certain areas. And they scrambled their monies together and they were able to get into that first house. And now they're sitting on that equity, right? That's because we have to push people to positions that they're uncomfortable with because they haven't been taught that. And so if they haven't been taught that, they'll never get to the ultimate goal of generational wealth where what I leave today will go to my kids and their grandkids and their grandkids and on and on and on. And so each one teach one. It's a simple philosophy. It's up to us to teach them because if not, they get behind in the great race of life. And he or she who was behind in the great race of life must run faster or forever remain behind. Each one teach one, that's us. That's the challenge to all of us in this room who are listening to this, this session. We need to leave here and make sure we're taking that information out to those who are not here today. This is great, do you hear, do you hear all of these solutions? We've got, we've got uh, a personal challenge that we can all do individually. We have uh, institutional changes that can be made. We have societal changes we can make. This is wonderful. Thank you all. And thank you for uh, digging in to that, um, that, that part of a life cycle of all of our lives, right? Of like rent and ownership, right? That's so important. 
It's so important, and it's part of what I think we're trying to really help us all to think about is um, that we, we are not trying to simplify the need for housing and livability into little boxes. We are trying to diversify the options that are available to people so that they can thrive, right? And their next generation can, th can thrive and on and on. So I have one more question for all of you. It's to wrap it up and I want us to, um, I'm a planner, I love to think about the places that we're gonna make, right? So how do you think a mix of housing types. We heard so many different ones. Like in addition to the, 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 the large lot single family that we all know and love, small lot, duplex, triplex, apartments, townhomes, condos, all these different places. Imagine them in uh, an, a, a newly revitalized, reinvested um, commercial corridor or main street. How do you think that mix of housing types, not neighborhood, will open up opportunities for more people? All of you. My husband and I have often talked about when we are ready to sell our single family home with landscaping and a pool and move to a place where um, before you know it, we could just lock up the home and leave. And we love the idea of living in a downtown corridor, right, where you can walk down to the coffee shop and walk to the park and say hello to the neighbors in the community. We look forward to that. And I think that if we have more of those products, it opens up my single family home for those young people who have lived in Midtown and had their fun enjoying life and now they're ready, to, oh, maybe I wanna have a bigger home for my family, right? I think that having a, an option for so many people is important. So I look forward to being able to open up my home so that when my husband and I can have a walkable community where we can enjoy um, not having to take care of the backyard anymore. <laughs> take care of the backyard, the pool, the front yard. I, I get that. Um, I think it's important to build on your point for us to start looking at options beyond where we live today because the house that we raised our kids in, it's now two people left in that house. And so when the grandkids come back, it's great because they got a playground right there in the house and they take advantage of every single room. Every single room is their playground, right? <laughs> But we don't need that house anymore. And the impact of that is, if we would open up our house and start moving to that downtown condo or place where we don't have all the responsibilities, it would also give a family the opportunity to send their kids to school in that community and be able to walk to school as opposed to be driven to school. So it opens up so many doors because right now we're seeing in Green Haven Pocket, you know, those who have bought homes and purchased homes, they no longer have kids who go to those schools. So we've seen the school population go down as a result of that. So I'm looking forward to that opportunity as well to move into a different form of mixed housing. And I really like um, the housing where it's transit oriented development, mm -hmm. where you can actually be right there at the light rail. I can go shopping right around the corner on the block. I don't need to get in my car anymore unless I want to like if I'm gonna drive to Oakland or something, but I don't even need to do that. So I really like the transit-oriented development type of housing where everything is right there. And we've seen some of that in Oak Park, which I'm sure you're gonna talk about a little bit more. And I can't thank you enough for what you've done to develop Oak Park. So that's what I would say. Love it. Thank you. I always, when I, when I think about it, I always use experience and then kind of vision forward. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you guys a story. Right after the pandemic hit, um, there was some stuff that happened where we got displaced from Midtown, which I'm sure folks know about. Um, and Julie Young, she is a developer here, uh, Urban Elements, called me and she said, we need to talk. I've seen this happen to you guys multiple times where you create place and then you get displaced. And that's not going to stop until you own something. So I was like, okay, this is like right when everything first hit. She's like, come over to my house. And I was like, oh wow, this is really serious. Like she wants us to come to her house during a time when we're not supposed to. So <laughs> I was like, all right, cool. So we, we go over, my wife and I go over and she like talks to us and it was the each one teach one moment. She's like, the way that you are going to change your situation is by owning 
more than just a house. You need to get into development and own some of the place that you develop and that you create and put what is necessarily the ownership at the bottom and then create the culture on top of what you already do. You guys are good at creating culture. That's what you guys do, but you're not owning it. So she said, let's do a test. I have a piece of land on 28th and U, and I've already worked with the city. I've already bought the land, um, and we're going to make the small parcel into eight different units. And what I was thinking is we could do a live workspace. And so you can have folks that live at the top and have their workspace at the bottom. And so then that way you're consolidating finances, so you're not paying two rents and two internets and two this. So it's like you're consolidating finances, and I know what you guys are good at doing and can do, and then you can create programming inside of that space, oh, inside of those spaces, and get everybody to work together to really boost up the equity. And so it's like, cool, let's do it, right? And so the project is called The Nest. So 28th and U, there sits an empty piece of land still right now, two years later, because what happened was, while we're going through developing the concept, curating the folks, I pulled 13 of the most talented, in my eyes, most talented, creative, black and brown folks that live in Sacramento right now, sat and had conversations with each of them and said, hey, we have this opportunity. There's only eight units, but between 13 of us, we should be able to get this, right? You live, down, you live upstairs, you work downstairs, we'll work together, cool. We go along the path, we line up um, a bank, fo uh, bank person to like help with the loan, all of these things. And one by one, all 13 of them could not qualify for their loan because of their taxes, their debt, their proof of income, all of these things. But they're people that you would see and be like, oh my God, they're killing it out here. And so I say that to say, like, imagine what would have happened if those eight people two years ago would have been in the middle of Midtown, in this spot, just in the two years that they would have built equity, consolidated their finances and built in their businesses. Like, just imagine those eight people, what that would have been for them today. Right? And so when you think about it from that perspective, it's like if we don't get to the root of it, then we're not really doing anything to actually change it for the next generation. And that's what we're trying to do here is like really change it for the next generation and working more effectively on all the different ecosystems, like the whole entire ecosystem around to like put the pipeline in place because we're all here, we all have pieces of the pipeline to like put somebody through from pretty much cradle to grave on a positive trajectory for their lives inside of this room. Like there's nonprofits that are helping with kids. Amber, I see you. Like there's, there's little pieces all around here that if we just put them together and like make it happen, then we're, we're there. We don't even have to imagine it anymore. It's like in the next five years, in the next 10 years, focusing on these places and doing the things that we all know how to do together will create those spaces even faster than we can think. I don't even have to end that. Sorry. <laughs> you gave me a microphone. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You can drop it. <laughs> that is a story. That's a real story. That's a real life. That's a, that is, that's what we're, we are, we're shooting to make that happen. That's what we all can do. All of us, everyone here, every, every organization, every sector, that's what we can do. Thank you all so much. Uh, I hope that you all enjoyed this conversation as much as I did and, and we are done. Thanks for going over.